a eukaryote that's not a plant, animal, or fungus. Okay, what else is it? What type of clade would do protists form then? Paraphyletic. Okay, how many groups are within that paraphyletic clade? Ten. Seven. Seven, good. Seven monophyletic groups, excluding plants, animals, and fungus, which are included in those groups. Okay, that's what a protist is. Well, is your question for me? No, I just, um, I thought you were going to Oh, okay. No. All right. So, uh, what are some, some other characteristics about protists? What are the different ways that you, they were classified in lab or on the video lecture? Nigerians? Nope. That's, uh, that's an animal. <laughs> but that was, so lab previous to that one. Okay, that's one, one way. Some of them are autotrophs. Let's stick with that. What else are they? Mixotrophs. Okay, mixotrophs. All right, what were you going to say quickly? Okay, good. Okay, what's a mixotroph? Yeah, so they have chloroplasts or they can ingest other things, which would be fun. But. Um, all right, what are some other ways to classify them? How they group together. Okay, good. So they're um, cellularity, right? So what are, the, what are the different ways they can do it? Colonies. Okay, they can form colonies. Well, that's bacteria. That's yeah. Bacteria. They're generally microscopic. Okay. Uh, they can be microscopic. Most of them are. Okay. Well, the microsco sco uh, microscopic ones are generally what cellularity? They don't form some of them. Good. Yeah, you can be unicellular. Or they can be multicellular. What's an example of a multicellular group? Algae, good, yeah, so algae, seaweed, find it in the ocean, those are multicellular plant-like organisms. Does anyone remember one of the colonial types that you looked under the microscope at? Volvox, good, classic example. So why was it colonial and not multicellular? What was that? Someone raise their hand. <laughs> you just like blurry down it. There, okay. <laughs> Okay, good. Yeah, so and a colonial organism then has all these little guys. They're all individuals. They may have even little flagella coming off of them. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're coming together. Yeah, and they're hugging. But they aren't the same organism. They're individual. They have their own DNA, their own processes for reproduction. Good. Whereas a multicellular organism, all those cells would belong to the same organism, have the same DNA. Okay. All right. Um, how else did we categorize our different protists? Okay, transportation. What were our different options there? <coughs> Okay, good. So pseudopodia, okay, which is the false foot. I didn't spell that right. See, this is why we need a word bank. I have an infinite word bank. <laughs> All right, pseudopodia, okay, which were the, what group used that form of locomotion? Amoebas. Amoebas, good. All right, pseudopodia and cilia and flagella and we 
We've talked about them multiple times. So, yes. Are cilia the things that are on the inside of your lungs that help like you move the mucus up? Yeah. So you have cilia in different uh, cells and tissues in your body as well. Yeah. Okay, and then we had one other way. Reproduction, so they can be sexual or asexual. Okay, and there were two types of asexual reproduction in the video lecture. Okay, what was the difference? Budding? And what was the other one? Just through mitosis, yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm going to draw... I'm going to draw one of these, and you tell me which one it is. <coughs> okay, why is it buddy? Yeah, good. So if one of them is smaller, it's budding off, right? Little guy is going to grow up to be a big protist someday. But mitosis, they are equally sharing whatever cytoplasm and cellular um, organelles are in the, in the cell. Okay, good. You guys know what protists are. All right, we're going to have, we're going to talk about protist, um, diseases, and then we'll talk about a few other protists which are important ecologically. All right, so um, this is our third group of diseases, all right? So this is going to be on an exam. You may have to look at whether the disease is caused by a protist or a virus or a bacteria, okay? So know the diseases that we went over. Know these ones as well. All right, the plasmodium forms, anyone know what disease it forms? Malaria. Yeah. Malaria, which used to be a worldwide prevalent disease, which killed millions and millions of people each year. Now is more localized to tropical regions. It used to be in the U.S. as well. Anyone play Oregon Trail and died of malaria? <laughs> okay, it used to happen. All right. Um, and we'll go over the life cycle of malaria in a second, okay? All right, Ger Gerardia. Good, Bieber fever. No, no, Oh, yeah. Okay, um, so this is why you don't want to, one of the many reasons why you don't want to drink out of streams, because this is passed out of uh, animal feces that poop into water and then it forms and grows, and then if you drink that water, you'll get sick. Yeah? Could it be transmitted by, like, from animal to human? Yeah. From touch? Oh, from touch? Uh, we'll, we'll say that, like, my dog, like, I couldn't kiss his head. Okay, well, so, it's, it's due to feces, so depending on which end you're kissing. <laughs> yes, it is possible. Oh, there, was, there was another hand over here. Was there another hand over here? No? Okay. But generally, it's like a deer or something poops in the stream. There's giardia, giardia in their poo, and then it, you drink, if you drink that water, you can get sick. And it caused basically severe diarrhea for a long time. Okay. Like a week. What? Yeah. You can die from it, but probably not. Okay. All right. Toxoplasma gondii. This causes to toxoplasmosis. Okay, 25% uh, of Americans already have this infection. Yeah, so about this many people in the class, oh, it's over there, have it, but are asymptomatic. So it, um, it generally appears in people that have weak immune systems, and then it kind of takes up. Yes? It's the same thing with tuberculosis, right? Like, I'm sure there's a couple of us in this room that have, but it's just not active in our... Yeah, I'm sure. I, I think tuberculosis is much smaller, like 1% to 3% or something like that. But, but yeah. Um, toxoplasmosis. One of the um, carriers of toxoplasmosis is... Anyone know? A common carrier? Cats, yeah. So this is uh, actually why you aren't supposed to dump kitty litter or cat poop in the toilet. Because toxoplasmosis 
that's one way it then enters into our waterways and can infect other animals and other people. Okay? Or you can get it directly from the feces of your cat. Yeah. So like, don't teach your cat how to use the toilet? Yeah. Don't teach a cat. How to, I know you can train them how to, how to go in the toilet, but that wouldn't be a good idea. Okay, um, this next disease, um, it's not really a disease. Well, it is. It's not really a disease as much as it is a, a toxin produced by marine algae. Different marine algae produce it, so I don't have a specific species. Um, but they release this uh, domoic acid. Okay, which is a neurotoxin. Okay, so if anyone has had uh, shellfish poisoning, this is one of the um, reservoirs of this demo demoic acid, so it can build up in shellfish. Um, and then if you eat too much of this shellfish with the demoic acid caused by the marine algae, it can make you sick. Yeah? Neuron is just a nerve cell. Yeah, so it has neurological symptoms. Um, there are marine mammals which can um, have been shown to have very advanced stages of pneumoic, pneumoic acid poisoning, and they can die from it as well. So seals and stuff, um, they eat a lot of fish. So fish is another reservoir, especially small fish like anchovies for this neurotoxin. Um, and more algae is being produced, and we'll go over a process um, in a minute about that. And so this is becoming more and more a prevalent problem in marine mammals and in shellfish and small fish industries. So I thought eating bigger fish would be more toxic to you because they fold onto it. So why is it that like, smaller fish are able to affect people? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, It's usually shellfish and anchovies is what I looked up and saw. Um, but yeah, larger fish have other types of contaminants within them, like heavy metals and mercury and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, this is a different, different thing. All right, the last one, uh, Negleria fowleri produces a uh, brain-eating amoeba. Okay. The actual incidence of this occurring is really, really low, but I just wanted to give you a cool disease. Okay. Okay. So this occurs in uh, usually is usually found in water that is very warm, like um, yeah. Can't, so not it's not going to be found too much around here, except in the heat of the summer. So maybe in the middle of summer, if you're swimming in and usually a lake, not a stream. Streams are usually colder water anyway. Um, and it's transmitted through the nasal passages. So someone swimming around in a warm, usually tropical lake may get some water up their nose. The little amoeba goes into the nose and then goes into the brain and starts eating the brain tissue, which causes them to go into a coma and their brain swells and they die. So 98% of the people who get this infection die from it. Yes, and actually there are some places where they will have signs that say, do not swim in this water because of, you know, different parasites. This may be one of them. Yes, nose plugs actually this is a recommended thing. If you're going to swim in a lake in, you know, Mexico in the middle of summer, wearing nose plugs would prevent at least some transmission of this disease. But it's very, very low. Something like 25 people die from it in the whole world. A year. That's still yeah, you don't want to be that statistic. I agree, but well, any other questions? Okay. All right. So those are five fun diseases for you to remember. Caused by proto. Um, there's a lot more protistin uh, diseases. Yes, those five. Good. All right. So we're gonna go over then the life cycle of malaria caused by Plasmodium. Okay, um, these are not drawn to scale. Uh, he also doesn't have any arms, so we need to fix that. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. All right, so we're going to start in the mosquito here in this uh, structure called an O-cyst. Okay, the O-cyst... makes these, a bunch of these, millions of these uh, sporozytes, which migrate from the digestive system into the salivary glands of the mosquito. Uh, the mosquito drinks the blood of a person, and now the sporozytes are in the blood of the person. Yeah, but we're not done yet, okay? The sporozytes then go into the liver. Oh, no. And they mature into what are called merozytes. And the merozytes can then go back into the blood and infect red blood cells. And within these red blood cells, they can multiply uh, through asexual reproduction and then burst out and then infect another red blood cell. And that's, these merozytes are what cause the symptoms of malaria. So ch fever and chills as they are bursting these red blood cells and then infecting more and more of the... Of the so is malaria uh, related to sickle cell? Yeah, so actually sickle cells um, are shaped differently, okay, and they aren't very good for conducting the oxygen and gathering oxygen, but these merozytes cannot infect them. Okay, so um, through virtue of that, people with sickle cell anemia because of those misshapen cells, are more resistant to the, the parasite. Yeah? Isn't it like the African American population that has more Yeah, so in areas actually where malaria is um, present, so Sub Saharan Africa, and also in Asia, then this is all, sickle cell anemia is also a higher prevalent. Yeah, yeah. right? So this is the heterozygote advantage. Yeah, and if you're a heterozygote, so if you're a carrier, you're also immune. So you'll have normal cells and some sickle cells, which will um, prevent infection. Yes? Is it the same concept of OSIS with um, ticks? Um, ticks, no, I'm not sure. The, those are different diseases that are... But yeah, the ticks um, bite into your and um, can give you parasites as well or infections. So like Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria on the tick, yeah. But their life cycle, the life cycle of the, this eukaryo is more complex than a bacteria, right? Bacteria is just going to asexually reproduce inside of you. Okay, so then these, where are we, merozytes. Some of them will form Uh, gametocytes. Oh, and all of this occurs, I should before, I should have said this at the beginning, but all of this occurs after meiosis. So what does that mean about the ploidy of these cells? Yes, they are haploid, okay? <laughs> So the sporozytes are haploid. They mature into merozoites, but they're still haploid. Um, and these gametocytes then are also haploid. All right, another mosquito comes along and drinks the blood of this um, ill-proportioned human. And it may pick up some of these gametocytes. In the mosquito digestive tract, it then matures into this funny shaped male gamete 
and this more normal shaped female gamete. Okay, so now that we have these haploid gametes, they can go through what process? Nope. Fertilization. Oh, I'm getting there. Okay. So there's the temple. Why is the temple outside? It's in there. It's in there. I don't know what I'm doing here. Okay. That's Moroni. All right. Um, so they, these are both haploid. And so now they're going to form what structure here? Zygote. Good. Which is what ploidy? Diploid. Okay. Then it goes through meiosis, forms an oocyst full of sporozytes. It starts all over again. Yes? Um, the, another mosquito. So this is a different, two different mosquitoes. One infects the human, and then another mosquito comes along, drinks the blood, and goes in there. Yeah. OK, so there are medicines, uh, both preventative and post infection to help with malaria. Has anyone gone to like Africa and had to take the malaria pills? Yeah, I hear they make you like hallucinate and have crazy dreams and stuff. So, but they are, they're preventative. Doesn't mean you're not gonna get malaria, but they will reduce the chances of getting malaria. Okay, so those are our diseases. Know that life cycle. The worksheet on my SVU has the figure from the book with a bunch of blanks in there. So that would more than likely be on the exam rather than having you draw it. But we'll go over that um, at the end, okay? Okay, so there's a couple of um, ecological processes. So this is, ecology is the study of um, organisms in their environment. So both um, the living things that affect their, how they live and the non-living things. Um, so, uh, we'll talk about algal blooms and how they cause eutrophication, okay? Um, algal blooms occur because, um, well, they occur naturally, but they occur uh, more often in artificial conditions because of fertilizer runoff. Okay, so what happens is a farmer has his farm over here. This is wheat, obviously. Okay, he puts fertilizer on there. Not all of that fertilizer is absorbed by the plant. And so when it rains, it pours. It pours fertilizer. And some of that fertilizer gets into the waterways. In fact, if you have lots and lots of farms right up, up, up next against a waterway, lots and lots of fertilizer then gets in the waterways. Okay? Fertilizer um, helps things grow. Okay? So what grows in the water? Algae. algae. So the algae... are then going to increase dramatically and uh, especially when there starts to be lots of sunlight, so in the spring and the summer, okay, they need sunlight for photosynthesis and then if they have this excess amount of nutrients, then they're going to bloom, okay? And the, so some the Alabama nat mascot, so University of Alabama mascot is what? Crimson Tide. Okay, the Crimson Tide is an algal bloom of red algae. Okay, so that's what it's referring to. Um, so in the spring or summer, you may have a bloom of this red algae. It'll cover 
kind of the top of the waterways and create this red tide. Okay. Um, what's so bad about this, though? Well, let's say I'm going to draw a little lake here. Okay. Normally, you have little plants living at the bottom of this lake. You have fishies in here. And you have some algae. Uh, and you've got lots of other things living in there as well, right? Okay, when you get this fertilizer, what grows um, or what responds most to this is all this algae. And the algae covers the whole top of our little lake. So now sunlight is all absorbed by this algae. It can't get through. So that means this plant dies. Okay. Um, now that the, uh, there's no plants there, there's also um, all these other organisms that can't grow. These algae also, they eat up all the oxygen. Yeah, they use it all up. So they're going through photosynthesis, which requires um, carbon dioxide, produces oxygen. But then also they go through respiration, which takes that oxygen out. Um, and so there's no oxygen. And so the fish die, too. OK, this process over here, this is called eutrophication. Okay, um, so what's essentially happen, happening is the trophic levels are reducing. We had a whole dynamic system where we had producers, plants, little insects eating the plants, fish eating the insects. We had these multiple trophic levels. But now with the fertilizer runoff and the algae, there's only one trophic level, the algae. They kill everything else. They use up all the resources. Yes? So the algae is kind of causing a monopoly of resources? Yeah, yeah. They use up more um, than um, which allows other other things to survive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you said the fertilizer makes the algae grow faster. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't that create nitrogen fixation because all of the big fish and everything can survive and it just kind of kills everything that tries to drink or eat from in there? Yeah. So this can be bad. You know, you can't. The algae itself might also produce um, toxins such as demoic acid, which would kill everything. All the dead things. Have you ever been in like a, a lake that's all green in the middle of the summer? There's a lot out in California. Yeah. And you see like fish floating that are just dead. Oh, it does. Yeah. So. It, it, uh, they produce toxins. Like my, my sister lives on a lake in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. She, they, you can't swim in the lake because of the algae, algal, algal blooms that are there. And you get sick. But, um, all oh, because of algae. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. I don't know how you can do that. Put up signs, maybe? Eviction notice? Well, a lot of it's microscopic, right? It's just microscopic. So some of it will form these like big, you know, colonies and masses, but that which you can physically take off. But even that would be too much work. So okay, some bad stuff. Um, let's talk about some good stuff. So, all right. So coral and lichens. We'll just talk about coral. Okay. What group, uh, what phyla do coral belong to? Good phyla. Nigeria. Yeah. All right, so the. <laughs> Nidaria. I feel like you're making fun of me right here. Okay, Nidaria. All right, so what type of symmetry do Nidarians have? Oh, gosh. Good. Well, they're not asymmetrical. 
They aren't Penta Radio. They are radio, right? Radio. So what happens is you have, um, so I'm going to draw a big rock here. Okay, that's rock. Yep. It's a rock. All right, and they have basically this stalk with these tentacles. Okay, and the tentacles will go all the way around in a ring. That's the radial symmetry, okay? But I just drew half of it. Within the coral, there are organisms living in there, protists, that are photosynthetic, okay? The cnidarians house them, protect them, um, give them a, a nice place to live. And then the protists, which are called zooxanthellae, Okay, the X makes another Z, Z sound. These are the name of the protists that are photosynthetic that live in the cnidarians, zooxanthellae. Okay, and they are autotrophic, and they use sunlight to make energy, and the coral then uses some of that energy um, for rent, basically, okay? What's that? Yeah, they're helping each other out, okay? All right, so this is called a mutualistic uh, relationship, which means they both get something out of it. So it's a positive association for both of them. And if you remove the zooxanthellae from the coral, the coral die. And that's happening through a process called chloral bleaching, which we're going to watch a video of. What happens in events where temperature increases is the zooxanthellae leave, right? And that's what a bleaching event is. Now, it doesn't mean that the coral is dead. It just means that the um, zooxanthellae were producing toxins that were going to kill it, so they had to get rid of it because it was too warm. But if it cools down, then they can come back in and they can recover. Um, but like they said, if this is happening more and more often, um, the ability to recover from that isn't going to be possible. Um, but uh, has anyone done snorkeling or scuba diving in coral reefs? It's a pretty awesome experience, right? Coral reefs provide a dynamic, um, very productive ecosystem. Lots of cool fish and colors to look at. Um, but generally, basically, with global warming, these coral reefs look like they are doomed and so snorkel and scuba dive now while they're still there. Are we going to snorkel in the glasses? Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, but for real. For real time. Yeah.